it's Anne Marie. Can you hear the beep? Leave me your bona fides. Anne Marie, it's Celeste. I am doing it, girl. I have taken the position at Melbourne and getting out of New York. I wanted to thank you again for everything you did. You were a rock. I can't imagine how I would have got through it all. Anyway, I will talk to you soon, but maybe not too soon, because I, I think a little time in the country will do me good. Dr. Williamson, it's Dr. Celeste Dupont. I know that we've already been over the patient profiles, and I really appreciate your patience with me. It's just, I worry about Joey and Melissa, the two PDD kids. It's hard to leave them behind, but it's for the best right now. Please call if anything comes up. Thanks. It's Dr. DuPont. Hello? Hello, Dr. DuPont. My name is Jones. I can drive from here. Oh, no, that's all right. I am afraid it's the rules. Yes, you've arrived during the stormy season. They blow in from the ocean. Always head for us. Thank you. Hello there. You must be Dr. Dupont. I'm Miss Donnie Mead, Director of Staffing and Admissions here at Melbourne. It is nice to meet you, Miss mm -hmm. Donnie Mead. Pleased to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Dr. quilly has been waiting for you. What a beautiful old place. We call it home. Now, did you want to go to your room and have a lie down or change? Or... Well, I'm anxious to meet Dr. Quilly. Very well, then. I know the feeling's mutual. Magnus, Dr. Dupont. Dr. Dupont, a great pleasure. For me too, Dr. Quilly. Take your coat. Yes, thank you. Found us all right. We're rather out of the way here. No trouble at all. Feet. You are so beautiful. I expected somewhat of a... Of a what? Plain Jane. <laughs> I don't know what I expected. You are precisely as I imagined you. Really? Your books have been such an inspiration to me. I've recently lost faith in my ability to help people. Let me express my deep condolences for your recent tragedy. To lose a, a fiancé, I can't imagine. How are you coping with it? Uh, it, it hasn't been easy. But I've been throwing myself into my work. I understand you are getting married this month. When, when you mentioned in your letter that a position was available, it seemed like the perfect opportunity. Credentials made it an easy choice for us. I have several guests I'd like you to meet. I love that you call the patients guests. It's more dignified. They're uh, of an interesting variety. A black coffee. Uh, we're, uh, rather remote, and there's a power issue, as you can see. Thanks for warning me. You might have noticed we're in a corridor where cell phone reception is... Uh,
poor at best. Yes, my GPS and my BlackBerry both went out. There's a landline on my desk. And an internet? Hmm. My friends, you know, won't expect to hear much from me, but I will need to make an occasional call. You know our philosophy, of course. You are who you think you are. And the guests take on the jobs and identities they wish. Here, you can be a philosopher or a, a gardener, a, a king or a cook. Whatever the guest chooses, it gives them a, a comfort level, a, a sense of direction. But you care for them. Of course. Now, are you ready to commit yourself? Yes, completely. Good. At dinner, you'll meet some of the staff. Yes, I'm right there. You don't have any food allergies or anything? No. Thanks. Let's go and meet some of the guests. Isadora, I'd like you to meet a distinguished colleague of mine, Dr. Celeste Dupont. Celeste will be with us for a while. Oh, Isadora, it is a pleasure to meet you. Oh, a pleasure to meet you, Doctor. Isadora is America's poet laureate. Oh. Translated into dozens of languages. She's currently preparing a reading here at Milburn. I love the smaller venues. So much more intimate, where one can really connect with one's audience. Well, poetry is a wonderful gift, Isadora. To translate the complex human emotions through the simple tools of words. How beautifully put, Doctor. The simple tools of words. I hope you won't mind if I steal that. <laughs> Not at all. You know, I, I find Milburn such a, a fertile place to write. Here, well, one finds perspective. A sanctuary. Exactly. Well, I, I look forward to our future conversations. Oh, as do I. As do I. Celeste, let me present Congressman Lionel Roberts. He's the president's personal advisor on foreign affairs. Well, hello, Congressman. And how are things in Washington? Oh, you know, it's always two steps forward, one back. Responsibility is huge. Oh, I can't imagine the stress. But I guess someone has to do it. Yes. Yes, that's it exactly. Someone has to do it. Well, we are in good hands. And this young man is uh, Herbert Willoughby. He's, uh, he's a fine actor and dancer. Well, hello, Herbert. It's nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. You excuse us. So, Shirley Temple. That's my stage name. Oh, I love the little princess. <laughs> That's my favorite. Yes, and we think that your father is dead in the war, and you're a servant in the orphanage, and oh. then he comes back? Yes, and, and Queen Victoria. I loved her. She was just like the real one. Oh, my God, wasn't she? Oh, I look forward to movie night. Hi, I'm the one you've been waiting to meet. I'm Bobby Gow. Well, hi, Bobby. And how are you doing? I'm good. You have gorgeous hands. Some soft skin. And I'll bet your panties. Black silk. French. Am I right? I am right, aren't I? Cut nice and low. With a little bow about four inches below your belly button, right where it starts to get very interesting. You haven't really had a lot of luck with women, have you, Bobby? Um... Are you behaving yourself, Bobby? Yes, sir. Let's get you settled in before dinner. We painted your room a few days ago. That fume should be gone by now. I keep meaning to number these. There's so many of them. It's on my to-do list. Right, this is the right one. Here we are. Oh, so nice. Here are your meal times and laundry schedule and Dr. Chloe's rounds. Great. You come in a stormy season. They blow in from the sea. So I've heard. Oh, do not forget your keys. <sighs> I forget my head. You know about our electricity challenges, so keep this handy. And another thing. We have a guest residing down and across the hall in the lockup. 
Evan Franklin. Dr. Quilly will tell you more about him. He witnessed the murder of his entire family. He's violently aggressive, quite hopelessly insane. Even Dr. Quilly's all but given up on him. Occasionally on stormy nights, Evan carries on a bit. But don't worry, his door is quite secure. Um, so is this part of Dr. Quilly's technique? Keeping the guests and the doctors in the same wing? I don't remember reading about that. No. There are no doctors in this wing. Well, then why am I here? You're a guest, my dear. No, I'm a doctor. I know you're a doctor, pet. But you're also a guest. Is this your idea of some sort of a joke? I'm afraid not. Really, Miss Dunningley seems to think that I'm a patient here. A guest? Yes, no, I know what you call them. But could you please clear this up? I would like a room with the other doctors. Um, why don't we find some time in the morning to talk about this? No, I would like to clear this up now. Plenty of time to sort it out. But what is to sort out? I just want a proper room. Celeste, you're a guest. No, I'm a doctor. I came here to work with you. Yes, of course. And uh, I'm sure you'll find the work fulfilling. But you can't leave. I would like my car, please. Now. I'm afraid we can't have our guests driving around all over the countryside. I'm calling the... What is going on here? I know this may be hard to comprehend, but you are committed. And you'll stay with us until you're well. This is crazy. I am leaving. Would you put me in a cage? In a cage? A steel cage. And I heard you ringing your bell and your voices and chimes. You've been through a lot. Don't patronize me. This is all a huge mistake. I, I just, I want to call my lawyer and he will vouch for my sanity. Celeste, listen to me. There is no cage, and no bells, no voices. You've had a traumatic experience in the death of your fiance. You've had a nervous breakdown. In a lucid moment, you called us for help, and that was a good decision. We can help, but you have to trust us. Do you remember any of the events around Paul's death? <clears throat> See, you have to work through these traumatic memories that you've hidden from yourself. In the meantime, you're a doctor, and a good one. You can help us with the other patients just as you want to. It'll help ground you while you uncover the past. 
Perhaps end these delusions and help you get healthy again. When that happens, well, <laughs> of course you can leave. Or stay, for that matter. No. I think that's quite reasonable. Don't you? I'll see you at dinner. Time for dinner. Hmm. This way. Cross country skiing trip has been cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friends and colleagues, let me formally introduce our newest staff member, Dr. Celeste Dupont. Dr. Fraser Wilson. How do you do? Uh, Dr. Herman Bessemer. It's a great pleasure. And Dr. Esther Bloom. Hello, Celeste. And, of course, Dr. Desmond Moore, who you bumped into in my office yesterday. Also a recent arrival here at Milburn. How do you do? Good, thank you. May I suggest we raise our glasses in a toast to our newest staff member, Dr. DuPont. Welcome. The prime purpose of the Institute is to keep the patients comfortable and content. If that is all we do, we are frauds. But most of our patients, guests, don't want to go back to society. Their only desire is to be what they are or what they believe themselves to be. My duty to my patients is to cure them and get them back into society, not maintain them in a state of derangement. Let's consider the consequences of your... Uh, good intentions. You know why the guests are here at Milburn? They are embarrassments. Yes. Their families pay large fees so they can be stored away and forgotten. And you want to send them home. Well, will they be met with love and compassion? If there was love and compassion, they wouldn't be sent to Milburn in the first place. And you want to send your patients into an atmosphere like that? Yes. If my patients are cured, let them contend with that atmosphere. I suggest that your motives have less to do with the patient and more to do with the doctor. The issue is not my ego. A doctor's duty is to cure. Then cure away, my friend. Have I ever stood in your way? What do you think, Dr. DuPont? Should our ultimate goal be a cure? Of course. But the question is, how is it to be determined when a patient is cured? And when the time comes, who decides if the patient is ready to go? My name is Dr. DuPont. And I know that it's scary. But the storm will pass soon. people you loved. And I lost
Wilson went to. It's hard. Yeah, it's like having a bad dream that you can't wake up from. You keep that, Evan. Don't be scared. I'm close by. You know, Celeste, it's not a sin. 20% of the world's population has some sort of psychosis at some point in their lives. But what evidence do you have that I have a psychosis? Loss of memory, hallucinations. Maybe it was just a vivid dream. I see. A vivid dream now, not reality. I mean, that's a wonderful first step. But you realize you've come through a period of substantial trauma. It looks Dr. Quilly. Look, I just want to get back to New York, OK? I'm not going to hurt myself or anyone else. But you chose to come here. You have to trust us and cooperate. Even with your professional expertise, it's difficult to remain objective. I respectfully disagree. There is nothing wrong with my mind. Try and stay calm. We have an agreement. We all want what's best for you. And what is best for me is for you to give me my damn car keys and let me get the hell out of here. I'm sorry, Celeste. We'll have to continue this when you're less upset. Trust and cooperate. Excuse me, I have to see another guest. Doctor, could you give me a lift to the next town, sure, please? No. There's been a huge mistake. Okay, they're keeping me here against my will, but I am not crazy. Please, can you please, you gotta help me. Please, 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 take the drive. Come on, come on, come on, just get up. Okay, okay. Hello. Well, that was quite an escape attempt. You scared the driver half to death. Dr. Quilly, in his wisdom, has assigned you to me. I hope you have no objections. I am not a patient. As old Quilly pointed out, I have a bit of a savior complex. I like making people well. well there are plenty of opportunities here for you. You know, I realize that this is a catch-22. You know, until I say that I'm crazy, I can't get well. Well, there is that. But you did sign the commitment papers. I thought that it was a contract. I just didn't read it properly. I've been briefed about your case. 
There was a traumatic incident, the death of your fiance. You remember nothing? No. Well, I think that's key in making sure you get healthy again. I suggest you settle in, carry on in your capacity as doctor, and uh, let me help you sort things out. You'll help me get out of here. I will do my best. Thank you. Good. This has been a good start. you do that? I didn't do this. I was having a bath. You know, and a patient must have, you know, or Mr. Jones, because he wants you to think that I'm crazy or to make me think that I'm crazy. We can check for fingerprints. They'd be yours. Look, I can't believe that you think that I did this. I didn't do this. You know, sometimes when a person subconsciously knows they've misbehaved, trying to escape, but they can punish themselves. That is ridiculous. Why would I do this to punish myself? I'll find her some clothes. These will do for now. Where did they come from? The storage closet. They fit perfectly. Oh, That suit looks good on you, from what I could see before we lost the light. So you all know what was done to my clothing? Yes. Dr. Pulley told us. I was accused of doing it myself. Ah. There we go. Celeste, you don't think you slashed the clothing yourself? Of course I didn't. Someone came into my room, and maybe you know something about it. Are you suggesting I had someone do it? Maybe it was a patient. My first thought was punishment. Hmm? She's punishing herself. I don't see punishment here. Rather, uh, calculated destruction. Uh, is there a clue in there? Destruction of the clothes is a desire to be naked. And what is to be naked? To return to the womb. To go so far back as not yet to be born. To be not born is not to be. I did not slash my clothing. Dr. Moore. Can you understand what I'm suggesting? I understand it, but I can't yet accept it. Will you concur that there is a parallel between committing oneself to Milburn and the desire to discard the old and don the new? Destroying the old clothing is to be done with the old self. It's possible, but unproven. I see no evidence to suggest that Dr. DuPont slashed the clothing. How are we to interpret the manner in which the clothing was destroyed? It was just gotten rid of it. The tearing, the ripping, the violence. A deep hatred of the old self. So, is there oh, a link sake. between this act and the death of Dr. DuPont's fiance, Dr. Paul Bernard? But I'm not going to sit here and have myself dissected. I did not slash that clothing, and I suggest that you figure out who did it, and then insult them with your theories. <laughs> Evan? Evan's me. 
You all right? Of course you're not all right. At least I have the freedom to walk around. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna open this, okay? So we can talk easier. You there? Well, if you need anything... Patients are potentially very violent, as you can see. Oh, I was going to ask you something. Would you like to come in as a consultant on some of my cases tomorrow? Yes. I like that very much. Okay, good. My office by nine. See, few women know this, and even fewer men. But what all women want is to be handled rough. They all want to be treated like whores. Well, right there, Bobby, we have a fundamental delusion to deal with. Come on, Dr. DuPont. If you were honest with yourself, you'd admit it. Of course, we could try a little experiment, me and you. Let me prove my point, so to speak. Bobby, be respectful. She won't admit it, but we understand each other, don't we? All women want to be punished. Every woman at Melbourne, and I would punish him, too. If it weren't for Jones. Mr. Jones? What do you mean? Well, he's not a very nice person, Mr. Jones. He likes to hurt people. Why do you think Mr. Jones would want to hurt you? Because Mr. Jones wants to punish all the women himself. You've met Isidore Snow. Yes. She prefers our sessions up in her room. Her poetry has been a lifeline for her. A lifeline? Mm -hmm. Yes. You see, Isadora killed her own baby, smothered it. We're not sure how or why. We're working on that. She hid the body and then began kidnapping other infants, three in fact, before she was caught. With the baby's own right? No. Oh. Oh, come in, come in. How lovely to see you again. Mm, likewise. Yes, oh, I see you're working with Desmond. <laughs> Lucky girl. Make quite a cute couple. Please, sit down, sit How down. How are you feeling, Isadora? I'm feeling, well, I'm feeling quite frazzled, actually. Can I offer you tea? Please. Right. Well, you see, my copy editor, he's driving me crazy about the new volume. And you see, I, I'm trying to get ready for a reading here at Melbourne. I have no time, and I have no idea what to wear. Well, perhaps you could help me with that, Celeste. Oh, I'd like that. Someone extremely famous is coming here to hear me read. Oh. It's a surprise. Um, well, I would love to start by hearing one of your poems. Oh, you want me to... You, you, you want me to read one of my poems now? Yes, if that's all right. I, I couldn't possibly, uh, because, um, well, because I, I'm not ready. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, but I can't. No, that's all right. You know, maybe another time. Yes, but I'm going to be totally prepared on the night, totally prepared, and I'm very excited about it. Maybe we could talk about what sort of subjects you like to write about and what inspires you. Oh, yes, inspiration. Well, oh, uh, birds in flight. The changing seasons, uh, baby carriages. Baby carriages? Now, that's interesting. Can we talk a little bit more about that? No. Dr. Moore, sorry to interrupt. Mr. Gow is bothering Cook again, and I can't find Mr. Jones. Excuse me, I will be just a minute. 
Don't be long. <laughs> you know, I understand that you've just come to poetry recently, yet you've already written enough for a reading, and you've accomplished so much. Well, it was as if a, a, a creative dam burst, and, and the words just flowed out. And was that Dr. Quilly's idea? Well, no, but he was very supportive of the idea. I owe him a lot. Well, not this Dr. Quilly. The real Dr. Quilly. The real Dr. Quilly. I don't understand. You see, the Dr. Quilly you've met is not really Dr. Quilly. No, we lost him, I'm afraid, some time ago. This Quilly is an imposter. And what happened to the real one? They killed him and buried him in the dungeon. Oh, shh. There we are. Mr. Jones is back. Where were we? The inspiration for a poem. I am so curious about her poetry. Are yes, you? yes. If only we could pry some out of her. Oh, she's so geared up for the reading. She said something funny to me today while you were gone. And apparently it's a secret, but she thinks that Quilly is an imposter. Really? What does she suppose happened to him? She thinks that he's been buried in the dungeon. She's quite convinced. I, I, I think about her connection to the child. You've been working with me all day. Do you think that I'm insane? Absolutely. Seriously, Desmond, you don't think that I slash my clothing, do you? It is hard to believe. I mean, you've seen me work. You know that I'm competent. You definitely know your stuff. Look, this has all just been a horrible mistake. Help me to get out of here. I can't do that, Celeste. If you keep progressing as you did today, maybe in a while we can work on a day pass. I thought that you were on my side. I am, Celeste. I won't help you escape, but I will help you get better. Thought you might like some tea, Dr. Beresford. What did you call me? <sighs> Dr. J. Pont. Sorry. <laughs> My old head. Who's Dr. Beresford? Um, she was the doctor here before you took a leave of absence. Good night, then. Good night. Thank you. Dr. Celeste Dupont, and I'm at the Milburn Institute, and I'm being held here against my will, but I am perfectly sane. Uh, I can give you references in New York. Please, please just send a car. Right. I'm sorry, Dr. Dupont, was it? Try to stay calm. There's a look after you there. You're very nice. No, no, no. I am telling you the truth. Go and find the nurse, and she'll give you something to make you feel better. No, 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 please. I'm telling you that I need help. Hello? So here you are. I've been looking for you. You're a bad girl making outside calls. Who are you calling? You calling the police? They never listen. Well, now you gotta be punished, doctor. Don't worry, it's not really you punishment with me. You're gonna love this.
morning, Celeste. Oh. Or uh, afternoon. You had quite a rough night. You were calling out and crying. Do you sleepwalk normally? Because we found you unconscious down the hall. He put me in the cage again. Mr. Jones again. Now, don't you do that to me. I was in Dr. Cooley's office last night. Now, why would you do that? To use the phone. And Bobby Gow, he followed me. He followed me, and he attacked me. And then Jones came, and he knocked him out, and then he drugged me, and he put me in the cage again. And there's Quilly's bells and like, the chimes and, like, the sirens. They just wouldn't stop. Celeste, that's just not possible. See, I know for a fact that Mr. Jones was in the city last night, and and Bobby Gow was in his room. I, no, don't you I, I do that to me. In there myself. Don't do that to me. Celeste, at the time of Paul Bernard's death, was there a, a siren, police, or ambulance no. that you might have no. heard and now associate with Paul's no. death? You follow me, and I will prove it to you. You know, it happened here. Good morning. It was, there was glass. It was, it was, it was, My, my dad had a family practice. And he was warm and interested in his patients. And I like to think that if I have some of that, it's because of him. How did you meet Dr. Paul Bernard? Paul was my prof in fifth year. And I always had questions after class. And we often went for coffee. And then one day, at the same time, uh, we just both reached out and grabbed each other's hand. It's very romantic. But now we have to talk about Paul's death. You see, you haven't told the truth to me or yourself. What? It's time to tell the truth, Celeste. Paul's death wasn't an accident. He killed himself, Celeste, when you found him. Do you remember that? No. You have to. You have to go back to that moment. He killed himself. And you found him. You feel as if you have failed him as a doctor and as a lover. <laughs> so you were attracted to Quilly's methods because yours had failed to diagnose your own lovers in time. Does all of this make sense to you? Yes. And you knew that. That's why you came here as a patient. That's good. That's good. It's 
very good. This has been a big breakthrough for the last first step. And you're getting well. Thank you, Desmond. Thank you for telling me the truth. Thank you. Well done. Ugh. Well, you often write your poems from a child's point of view. Why is that? Well, we are all children at heart. In our last session, you were telling me a little bit about your family. Could we talk about that again? No. Your husband? No. Your child? You know. You really do remind me a lot of Dr. Beresford. So pretty, so concerned. Perhaps it's because you're wearing her clothes. Her clothes? What do you mean? The clothes that Miss Donnymead gave you to wear. They belong to Dr. Beresford. That scarf, she used to wear it a lot. I always admired it. Could I try it on? Sure. Why doesn't Dr. Beresford have her clothes? She doesn't need them anymore. She's buried in the dungeon with Dr. Quilly. Isadora, we have been working on changing your belief that Dr. Quilly is not the real Dr. Quilly. And I thought that we were making progress. But you still believe that he is buried down there. Well, I don't like to disappoint you. And now you think that Dr. Beresford is buried beside him. I'm afraid it's true. She took a leave of absence. I've seen the graves. Now, I've decided I like this one. Could I please borrow it for my poetry reading? Sure. You're very nice. Don't let them kill you, too. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our esteemed poet, Isadora Snow. Thank you. Thank you. I am. Um, I'm so excited, I'm quite breathless. But I am completely ready to perform for you this evening. And that is because we have with us a very special, very famous guest. Please put your hands together. In applause for Miss Winfrey, Miss Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> now, my first poem is called Cold Floors. There's the responsibility, he told me. He had always admired his nanny, but the floors were cold. They drove the nail into the wood. I could feel the movement like zen. There's the lady with the baby carriage again. Clean on Saturday, sleep on Sunday. All this restlessness inside me. I only wanted my dolly. And that's the tragedy. The fish is not good. Why was the floor so cold? And whose nanny was it? Excuse me, what kind of doll? Oh. I ate bad fish once in Shanghai. I'm so sorry, Oprah. Please, could you stop talking? But you're awful. Well, Terrible. Um, my second poem is called Black and White. Nothing is black and white. Bessemer, why don't you shut up? For once. Oh. Who played a trick on her? Please, could you stop talking? That should have been the therapeutic line. 
I didn't eat fish and dog here. I can't think. I have to go back to my room. I like cold floors. You have embarrassed me in front of Oprah. You have embarrassed me. Everyone's quiet. Do you not understand? This is art. That was the rudest display that I've ever seen. Guests and doctors both. You know how important Isidore's poetry is to her. And you should be ashamed of yourselves. aware that Isadora was restricted from having any belts or scarves, anything that she could harm herself with? No. Well, it was in the file. Didn't you even read it? The scarf seemed like an innocent request. How was it that you found Isadora? It, it was during the power failure. I, I heard a crash. I went out into the hall, and I saw that Evan's door was open. His door was open? Yes, he'd escaped. And so I was worried that he might hurt somebody or himself. So I called Mr. Jones for help. And, and then he was coming, and I ran upstairs. Up the stairs? Yes, to hide. I hid in a room, and then I heard him leave. And then I saw her. Celeste, Evan couldn't possibly have escaped. You must have imagined the door being open or, and possibly dreamt he was chasing you. No, I saw the door open. He, he must be able to get in and out of his cell. Now, he followed me. But he gave me back my handkerchief. What handkerchief? Give me back my handkerchief. He does when he did. Celeste. The idea that Evan can get in and out of his cell at will is, um, unrealistic. I think what you both fail to recognize is that even though Celeste is still 
highly functioning, she is still deeply ill, perhaps even more delusional than we thought. I'd like you to cancel your session with Desmond and rest in your room for the remainder of the day. Miss Dunnemead will bring you your meals. Hello, my dear. I've got your laundry. How are you coping? What a thing for you to have to go through. Tragedy. Well, at least she's at peace now. Isadora told me that this clothing belonged to Dr. Beresford. Is that true? Isadora had quite the imagination, bless her. Good night, my dear. Hey, there's sweet buns. What brings you down here? This where you come with the good Dr. Moore. You know, we've all been speculating. Ain't much of a love nest, but there's no accounting, is there? What are you doing down here? <laughs> Joan! Joan! They can't hear you down here. You can call all you want. Sweetheart, you almost made me miss my shot. Dr. Cooley says I'm the best rat catcher they've ever had. I always get them excited. After a kill? Yeah. Um, I, I agree with Dr. Cooley. Yeah? I know you're a terrific shooter. Yeah, it, it must feel good to, to rid the place of them. It does feel good. Oh! <laughs> How do you feel? Do you get excited after a successful hunt? 
You've only just started. Hmm? You've only just started. Yeah. yeah. I have only just started. You're there. What? I, 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 there's a rat behind the counter. Desmond. What is it? I was just down in the cellar. Down in the cellar? For what? It's the middle of the night. No, no, I needed to see for myself. Okay, there are graves down there. And there are labeled boxes and suitcases with personal belongings, including Dr. Quilly's. Okay, so now why would Dr. Quilly's personal belongings be in the basement unless what Isadora said was right? The real Dr. Quilly was murdered. And the current Dr. Quilly... I think that he killed Isadora for telling me. And Dr. Beresford, why are her suitcases down there? And Miss Dunnymead has her clothes. So I think that they may have killed her when she found out about Quilly. Okay, all right, all right. Just, just take it easy, okay? It's all right. Let's just think this out logically. Hmm? Yes. It. I, I want you to just start breathing deeply for a minute, okay? Okay, now look at this with me, as if you were the doctor, mm -hmm. and you're analyzing a patient. Now, first consider the patient's previous behavior. The patient has experienced things that may not have been real. The cage with the clock and the bells, the question of who ripped up your clothing, the attack by Bobby Gow when he was locked in, and then being chased in the dark by Evan Franklin when he never left his cell. No, I believe that Evan was there. And he gave me back my handkerchief. You're a professional psychiatrist, Dr. DuPont. But I saw the graves. Okay, let's start there. Did you know that they were repairing the foundation in the basement? The, the plans are on Quilly's desk. They're not graves. They're part of the construction. And the suitcase with Quilly's name, no doubt, is just some uh, unneeded personal effects. There's a whole storeroom of donated clothing on the third floor for the guests. Bearsford herself donated some before she went on leave. You just happened to, to fit Dr. Bearsford's clothes. You're her size. That's how you got them. You're a doctor. You also have a mental illness. You know that, don't you? You're, you're struggling to separate fantasy from reality. You're doing so well. This is just a minor step backwards, okay? We're still in the early stages of your therapy. Now, you are going to get cured. We are going to, to, to get through this together until you are well again, I promise. I'm going to walk you back to your room. Please, don't be an illusion. Dr. Moore and I have decided it's uh, time for you to move on to the final stage of your treatment. I'm worried it's too soon. What is the final stage? The truth. The truth about Paul Bernard. I know the truth. You told me. The suicide story was an interim first step, I'm afraid. It, it got you half the way there. You've blocked the deeper memories from your mind. As a psychiatrist, you'll find this fascinating. Okay, for God's sake, what are you talking about? Paul's dead. Paul's dead, isn't he? Yes, he's dead. But not by suicide. You see, uh, you killed him, Celeste. You shot Paul Bernard. Suicide. No. You had to accept Paul's death uh, in stages. Uh, this is the final stage. You were arrested for his murder. You were found mentally incompetent to stand trial. You were declared criminally insane, and you were committed here to Milburn. Hey, I don't remember any of this. I didn't kill Paul. Why would I kill Paul? I remember finding him in flashes and there was blood and he was lying forward in his desk a gun 
that's good, Celeste. That's what you remember. We'll need to keep going deeper into that memory. No, but I, I couldn't have killed him. I wasn't arrested. I remember driving here alone to take my position here. You were brought here in handcuffs by two court officers. Don't you remember? I don't remember any of this. Your lack of memory about the uh, murder, your subsequent psychological evaluation, and you, you're being brought here. It can all be explained by your deep-seated guilt. It appears Paul had been carrying on different affairs for some time. To his patients, you found out. I blocked it out. It's the key to all your delusions, Celeste. You made the final big step, Celeste. Let the true healing begin. How much fun it can be. You know, when I was a little girl, I used to muck out the stables for free rides. Oh, yeah? You look like you've been riding your whole life. This is like riding a bicycle. Thank you for suggesting it. You are doing so well. I owe it all to you, Desmond. I'll see you later. All right, boy. Now, where did they put your oats, huh? There was stuff to do, but she said it didn't matter. She's making the choice. Desmond, I have to talk to you. Can it wait? Uh, I'm in a session. No. Would you please forgive me? I'll be right back, Herbert. I found my car. Okay, you know what that means? That means that I did drive myself here like I remember. That means that I was not in custody, and that means I did not kill Paul. Okay, Dr. Quilly has been lying and manipulating me. I am not a murderer. Celeste, you know what the mind can do. Please, please, just come and see the car. I was getting oats for the horses. And then... No, it was right here. The car was right here.
her all this good work. She was coming along so nicely. Now she's backsliding. We have to be proactive. Well, it doesn't help that she's so familiar with analysis. Perhaps it wasn't a good idea to bring her here to Milburn. It was all going so well. How could she have found the car? But don't blame me. That's Jones's territory. He's usually so efficient. I'm afraid we're going to have to deal with Dr. DuPont the same way we did with Dr. Beresford. I can't afford. Don't be such an ass, Desmond. We always see our way through these things. It's never a good idea to get close to the guests. I've, I've warned you about that. We'll sort this out like we always do. Yes, we will. Oh. Quilly has uh, decided to take a leave of absence, and I will now be the acting director at Milburn. Congratulations, Desmond. Mm. Yes. Excellent choice. No. No, he is lying. Okay, Dr. Quilly is dead. He did not take a leave of absence. His body is in Desmond's office. Okay, did you hear me? Quilly is dead. And I think that Desmond killed him. Say he's an imposter. Okay, and, and I think that Desmond is too. And I think that they killed Dr. Beresford and probably others. Okay, we have to call the police. Okay, did you hear me? I saw the body, and we have to call the police. Desmond is an imposter and a murderer. Could you pass the buns, please? Of course. Fraser Wilson, where did you take your postgraduate studies? I... I can't remember. Dr. Bloom, in which hospital did you do your residency? I have no idea. You are doctors. That's very smart, Celeste. You don't disappoint me. You see, years ago here at Melbourne, the patients grew tired of the incompetent doctors, analyzing them and medicating them, telling them what to do. 
So we decided to replace them. Replace them? Yes. You know Quilly's philosophy. You are who you think you are. Former patients are now doctors. What happened to the doctors? Ah, well. They took uh, leaves of absence. I think this is probably an appropriate time for some reintroductions. Dr. Fraser Wilson. His real name is Ed Ricketts. Pushed a car with his wife and children off a cliff in Vermont. Dr. Herman Bessemer. He's actually Joseph Piper. Murdered five prostitutes in New Jersey. Dr. Esther Bloom. Her real name is Molly Onderdunk. She poisoned four wedding guests in Toronto. We all have our stories. And Miss Dunnymead? Felicity Morgan. She went into her accounting firm and shot half of middle management. And who is Desmond Moore? His name is Damon Bushby. Tortured his wife and her lover to death. You see, we are all patients like you, Celeste. The question is, will you join us and continue on here at Milburn? Or resist, like Dr. Beresford did? That's too bad. It's disappointing. She would be missed. She was down in the basement. Would you just go see that she didn't turn off the power grid? I was worried about you. How do you feel? I, I don't like to rush you. Uh, but you never did really answer my question. I've grown rather fond of you, Celeste. So, uh, you have another chance. It's a question I asked Dr. Beresford and all the others. Would you accept the situation here at Melbourne and stay with us? I need to know the truth. Did I kill Paul? Uh, Paul? Paul, Paul. I'm so sick of hearing about Paul. No, you didn't kill Paul. He killed himself. But you had to think that you killed Paul so that you could be one of us. That you could go on being who you thought you were. It's all falling apart because you won't play the game. You know, I just don't think you're a really good fit here in Milburn, Celeste. In fact, I think maybe it's time that you took a leave of absence. You know, I can help you. Now I could give you treatment. <laughs> treatment? You're gonna give me treatment? I don't need treatment. Celeste, I'm perfectly sane.
three steps ahead. Have you found Danny Meaden Jones? No, no, they cleared out, but we'll find him. What about the graves in the cellar? And the forensics is down there now. Listen, we ID'd the body you knew as Quilly. It's a Rupert Preston. He's a patient here. Damon Bushby killed him. Lucky he didn't kill you. I had some help. Evan? It's OK. So this is Evan Franklin. And he saved my life. How do you do, Mr. Franklin? What are you plans, doctor? Are you going back to the city, or...? Well, the OHM has asked me to stay on as interim director while they find new staff. What'd you tell them? I haven't given them an answer yet. But a little time in the country might do me good. Come on, Evan. <laughs> 